OK, thank you, Marie. Good morning, everyone. Just to remind you that this meeting is being filmed and will be broadcast. So by staying in the meeting, you're actually agreeing to be filmed and broadcast. Um, Marie, can we have any apology, please? Uh, yeah, so I've received apologies from Dr. Rory Honey, Dr. Nicola Decker, Ron Shields, um, his substitute Paula Anderson is attending in his place, yeah. and um, David Radbourne from NHS England, um, and then also Dr. Sarah Schofield, who um, has stood down from the board. Right, that's it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, that's the ones I'm aware of. If if anyone else is aware of any others, please let me know. No. OK. Can I just take you all then to the minutes of the last meeting? Um, I'm happy with them. If everyone else is happy with them, we can note them and move on. Has anyone got anything to say about the minutes? Or are you all happy? Yeah. Happy to agree, thank you. Right, right. I've got a few announcements, a few more now than I had originally. Um, first of all, the Hampshire Safeguarding Adults Board annual report has recently been approved at the HSAB board meeting on the 24th of June, and we will be circulating it to health and wellbeing board members for your information. I'd also like you to note that Dr. Sarah Schofield and Mark Cabin have left the board and can I ask them for their contribution? Councillor Trieski and Councillor Stallard are also no longer members of this board. Um, this is also the last meeting for Christine Holloway, who I think has been here almost as long, if not longer than myself, and has been a valued contributor to the board. And Christine, if you are here, and I can't see you at the moment, can I just say thank you for all you've done? And every time we do something now, co-production is the first thing that comes to my mind and will continue to be. So thank you, Christine, and good luck for the future. I'd also like to welcome Councillor Chad to her first meeting as the new executive lead member for Children's Services. So thank you. So welcome, Roz. Um, I would also like to mention three things. Sorry, I'll just get them up. The first one is to talk about the staying up late ambassadors. Um, and HCC is fully supportive of this. And this is where people with learning disabilities are actually allowed to choose when they go to bed. And I'd just like to say since 2015, all our support contracts have included the requirement to have flexible uh, shifts in order to facilitate this for people with learning disabilities. I would say, although the, the, the campaign is called staying up late, I would also say that should also be allowed to stay in bed later if you want to, especially if you had a late night the night before. And we encourage, we, Hampshire County Council, encouraging all our providers to promote this message and ending fixed bedtimes. Uh, Graham, do you want to add anything to that? Because I know you're very much in favour of this as well. No, I think we might have lost Graham, but we can come back to that later. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and again, I'll ask your advice about this. I will ask your advice um, towards the end when we're discussing our future thing. I've had a request from the Alzheimer's Society to come and chat to us about the pathway for dementia. They've, they've done this to several other authorities. They would like to come to us. Now, I've noticed that at our meeting in October, one of our subjects is going to be dying well. And that's one of the things the Alzheimer's Society is focused on as well for people on the pathway. So if you could just bear that in mind, and when we come to discussing whether we would like to invite them to come and talk to us and see what they've, they've done recently in the way of research and what their findings are. OK, Graham, you're back now. Do you want to say anything more about the staying up late? 
Yeah, thank you, and apologies. I, I couldn't get um, myself on onto screen view, and indeed my microphone was sticky as well. So, um, staying up late, it's it's a user-led national campaign, effectively, which is uh, championing the right of, as you already said, Councillor Fair has the right of um, younger adults with learning disabilities and a whole range of supported living environments uh, to choose bedtimes. But it goes beyond that. It, you know what clothes they wear, who they see what they have to eat in a nutritious and appropriate way, of course, um, but is supporting uh, younger adults with learning disabilities to live a full and independent life. So along with most other local authorities as commissioners of, of uh, support to younger adults with learning disability, we were contacted um, and uh, we've responded very positively uh, in line with what you've already said. It's, it's really, really important, particularly as we're uh, coming out of COVID that we do everything that we possibly can in support of a community across the country which has been particularly adversely impacted uh, by COVID. So really a uh, positive campaign, we're f throwing our full weight and support behind it. Thank you Graham. Right, um, right moving on, I think we're going to the board survey response and actions and Simon I think you're going to do this one. I am. Thank you, Councillor Fairhurst and colleagues. You've got a, a short presentation uh, in your pack. Um, just for a kind of summary, we did a survey um, uh, kind of during the uh, early part of this year, uh, and it's just to really note the re results. It was um, a fairly informal survey, qualitative survey, uh, just looking at how the board has been working and what the key things to move it forward. Uh, really thanks to Samaya. Uh, who really helped pull the survey and the presentation together. Um, and I think, uh, you know, often these things that we, we're doing uh, actually a really uh, good job from what the survey result says. Uh, people are, as, as Liz says, sorry, Councillor Fair says, some people have been around for a long time and actually we've really worked together really well and we continue that. Uh, and people are contributing to the board um, really effectively and we need to continue that and we're building up more trust and one of the things we will do is around making sure that both in the public um, meetings, but also we've had some workshop style meetings, which has also helped those kind of uh, conversations and the board to work really well. So we'll continue with both of those uh, going forward. And as you mentioned earlier, Councillor Fairhurst, uh, co-production is a really key part of that to make sure we hear uh, the, the, you know, the journey of the user, the population in that. So uh, we've really put that in, in centre of center of the um the board our governance again we've got a real clear definition with uh, uh those things are working well uh with samaya's uh, expertise we really have a, a clear a forward plan and we're going to develop an action tracker as well so i think those things will really help us to make sure that we don't just have meetings that have actions that we're not tracking in a um not in an over um complicated way but just make sure we know what we're doing and what what the board's agreed and equally, uh, like today, we've got an update on one of the themes. I think those theme reviews have been really welcome to really kind of dig down into what we're doing um, and we'll continue those uh, going forward, making sure we review those on an uh, annual basis and, and the annual report really drove that forward. Uh, absolutely vital and uh, many comments about measuring outcomes, and that's on page 18 of your pack, uh, and the annual update of themes really made sure that we did have outcome measures and we um, and what we're looking at. So that's been really helpful. Um, and so we will continue to do that um, as the presentations come forward on the themes. We will make sure outcomes are noted and we will look at that. And we are using data and insights to develop those plans. So uh, there's an awful lot of work behind that, but the board needs to be sure that each area is developed on uh, insight and data from the population, um, co-production, and on the JSNA, which we've got an item on later on. So I think uh, Councillor Fair has really short presentation on that survey, but great to do that. Um, I wouldn't propose that we repeat the survey too often, but we may want to do it in say another 18 months time um, or before if that's what the board is feel is helpful. Right, thank you, Simon. Um, any questions, for Simon? Ah, someone's got their hand up, but I can't see who it is, I'm sorry. It's Patricia Hughes. Ah, uh, Patricia, welcome. Thank you, 
Councillor Fairhurst. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to feed into this question and everybody else to fill in as well. Uh, Simon, probably just a couple of questions for you, if I may. Uh, one is around the measuring outcomes and the ambition. It's OK measuring what we've achieved, but actually, what is the ambition, I suppose? I'm just reflecting. I I'm very lucky in heart. We have some of the best health, health outcomes in the country. So who do we actually then seek to assess ourselves against? What is it? And I'd really just like us to reconfirm our, our position that we're going to be very ambitious on behalf of our residents in terms of actually delivering for them in terms of the health output. So I'll let you come back and comment on that one in a minute. I suppose the other comment, um, and I just, I'm just i curious, I, I don't know how we're going to measure this, but if one of the findings was being more active around addressing boundary issues between organisations and, and also places and spaces, how are we going to prove success against that at the end of the year that we've actually challenged ourselves around those border issues to make sure that we're working better across those in terms of, you know, we talk about sometimes pooling of budgets and all, you know, how are we doing that? So what are the succession measures that we'll, we'll be able to prove that we've we've improved from that? Thank you. Uh, so you're absolutely right. We need to be ambitious. And I think uh, we are in a place where actually uh, probably previously our even measuring our outcomes was probably a little weaker than we'd like. So we've got to a place where we're measuring that. Now we've got a bit of a baseline from this year. You're right. We need to kind of move that forward. And as uh, as we develop the plans and the um, kind of the chapter plans that we've got, we will make sure that there's ambitious outcomes. Uh, and, and you're right. Heart is an area of very good health. So how do we kind of make the next step to improve that? And how do we do that as a system and making sure that we don't, um, as it were, leave populations behind? And as a health and wellbeing board, we need to. Um, make sure that we focus on those areas that aren't uh, so um, fortunate in their health outcomes and their uh, and other outcomes. Uh, with regard to the boundary issues, yes, it's not something that's easy to measure, but I think uh, what we have got is a range of people from a range of different um, geographies around this table. Uh, and I was just reflecting on the kind of area that Peter Bibway is in on dying well. We've managed to kind of learn um, from different sides of kind of different parts of the NHS and uh, with NHS colleagues in it, it's become a lot easier with kind of a more uh, perhaps joined up commissioning landscape. And as we move that forward, I think there's something we can do there to make sure that we um, look at our areas we are serving, whether that's um, in our roles, but make sure we look at the whole of the uh, whole of Hampshire, which is our role here, to um, think where we want to focus our efforts. And actually, we need to think about that as a population and people move around population. So I think it is a, a key issue, but I think we mustn't get stuck on boundaries and just always look at the populations we want to serve. Hey, Julie. Sorry. I think Christine might have been um, before me, but I'll I'll make my point <laughs> quite quite quickly for Christine to be able be able to say something. Um, I just wanted to introduce, I think, um, in in the context of the reviews that you talked about, Simon, the fact that um, it would be really helpful, I think, if as the the board does develop this um, place where we can have more honest um, conversations, the idea of what's not working well and what the blockers are and so that we can expose those much more to have um, some dialogue in the so it's, it's great to reflect on what's gone well over the last year but actually what's really going to help us to move forward is where those blockers are where those real kind of challenges are um, and, and that might be you know connected to boundary issues or all, all sorts of different things um, so that's the just the point that I wanted to to make thank you. Again, that's really helpful, Julian. I think as we move forward with the kind of chapter themes, let's be open and honest with ourselves about, as you say, what's not going so well and, and what can we solve, as you say, not in a blame way, but actually let's be open about the issues and how do we solve them together. Right. Christine, I'm sorry you missed us saying that co-production is written on our hearts forevermore <laughs> and how much we're going to miss you. Well, that's very kind of you, but and my successor will, I'm sure, do a really good job. <laughs> I shall miss you all as well. I shall miss having my opportunity to have the occasional rant. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to say this morning, um, I, on page 17 on governance, 
Uh, it's great having the the actions set out, and I think the actions that are set out are really good actions, and I wholeheartedly support them. But can we please add another action? Because the very first finding is a clear definition of what the Health and Wellbeing Board is would help define the governance. And there isn't an action to say, give us a clear definition. I can remember conversations in the past of which the one that's really stuck in my mind is how important it is that what the Health and Wellbeing Board does is to look at the, what management consultants used to call the wicked issues, to look at the things that cross boundaries and that we can't resolve individually. What the Health and Wellbeing Board shouldn't be doing is receiving reports from this section or that section or that body saying, this is what we've been doing. And everybody says, oh, splendid. What we need is to focus on the cross cutting things. So I've got two questions. Could we mean it that we're going to develop a clear definition? And secondly, can that clear definition include a focus on the cross cutting, particularly difficult issues to resolve? So I come back on that. I think, Christine, you're, you're right. I think one of the, the as the changing landscape and as the ICS system settles down, it, it will be clear what's going on in the ICS. Um, and then it's really clear what we're focusing on. I think uh, perhaps that clarity is around the health and well-being of our population rather than thinking about integration of health and social care. And it's just been really clear about that. Uh, so that's really helpful to help the theme leads move their chapters forward. Or to look at some of the proposed changes to public health um, services. Um, it just feels like if our, if our remit is health and well-being of our population, there are some pretty significant proposals that are currently out for consultation. And I'm probably trampling all over the governance in a horrible way, and it's probably not at all appropriate. But it just seems a bit odd for this group to be meeting today with that out there and, and not having a conversation about what the implications might be for the health and well-being of the population we serve. But tell me that the governance is all wrong and that would be completely inappropriate and I'll get back in my box. Simon, do you want to answer that or do you? Uh, well, as it, uh, yeah, I think I'll just say very carefully, Alex, you're absolutely right. We need to think about all issues that impact on the health and well-being and how we do that in a way that uh, as organisations, uh, obviously we have our own uh, kind of governance and lines of accountability, but how do we do that as Health and Wellbeing Board, have an open discussion about what those issues might be so that all organisations are cited on those um, and how we do that. So I think, uh, yeah, absolutely, we need to have discussion as partners on, on what, what that is, and then individual organisations need to respond um, or receive responses as appropriate. And how has today with the consultation now I think I probably need to lead to the um, experts around the table in democratic issues. Yes I, I, I would sus suspect we need to wait for the consultation to see what it, it throws up and then bring it to the board if that's okay Alex because it is just a consultation at this stage there nothing has been decided so we need to wait. Um, Matt did you want to come in? Well, it, it was just on the on a similar point to Alex, really. I mean, if um, you know, if we take what the spirit of what Christine said and and try to deal with some of the the wicked issues, that certainly seems to be one of the kind of wicked issues of the of the moment, doesn't it? The um, um, the, the proposed changes to public health, and it, they're they're certainly issues that cross um local authorities and health bodies, and and I know, of course, some concern amongst my clinical colleagues. Um, I, I'm just a bit puzzled by by what you say, Councillor Fairhurst. W w why is there a need to wait until the proposals uh, uh, have been consulted on before they're considered? Well, we were actually seeking the public's views on on what we should be doing in order to enact savings. Now, depending on what the public say, will actually affect what savings we enact. Um, and therefore, you know, we you, you can certainly respond to the consultation saying what you think. And in fact, I would advise you all to do that just now. But but there's no point talking about something that might never happen. Oh, OK, so so the the amount that has to be saved is not a, a concrete amount. You mean that there is some flexibility in that, do you? Or... There are savings to be made, but how they're made is, is flexible, shall we say. 
and, and is there is there flexibility about where the savings are made? Do they have to be made in public health or can they be made in roads or I don't know, whatever else the, the county council spends money on? <laughs> Well, if they're not made in public health, they will have to be made in other departments, yes. Um, and other departments have their own budgets and their own savings requirements. Um, and life does get difficult at times, and that has to be addressed. Graham is itching to come in here. I, I, I'm still talking. I I'll talking. Before I do, I, I'll just say, you know, I think we'd absolutely recognise that, that, that local authorities have, have different decisions to make and have different uh, you know a different financial regime to those of us in the NHS who I'm sure uh, you know you would look at us and think that we have a, a kind of open checkbook and in, in a sense in, in the sense that um, you know we have a different financial regime I, I do recognize that. So. Right uh, Graham. Yeah thank you I'm not sure I'm itching to come in but I feel that I must. Um, <laughs> So I, th I think I think the point is well made, but I, I would just underline it's a consultation and we, we are really keen to hear uh, views of uh, our public, of residents, but also our partners. So please don't hesitate to submit your views. The, the, the point is alongside the Health and Wellbeing Board, and I think in due course um, it would be uh, important uh, to have further conversation uh, about this and indeed many other issues, just to, to underline what Matt's just said. Um, thus far since 2010, Hampshire County Council has had to realise annualised, not total, annualised savings of £600 million. Um, and the uh, other consultation out there at the moment is the balancing the budget consultation, which is a stage one uh, high level consultation, which will require Hampshire County Council in the 2023-24 financial year to realise a further 80 million of savings. As things stand, because of statutory duty, increasingly the council is spending its revenue budget in the field of uh, social care, both for children and for adults, at the expense of all those other things. And all of those other things go to things like the road network. And I'm sure we all have views about the state of a road that we may travel on on a frequent basis in terms of potholes and so on and so forth. But there are consequences to all of those decisions that Councillor Fairhurst and, and others will make in due course. Alongside the Health and Wellbeing Board though, just to, to underline the governance point, the um, Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee has established a working group. It met on Monday of this week in person. It's established a working group specifically uh, to work with Simon and his team with regard to uh, the consultation that's out there at the moment. Um, and, and in terms of that scrutiny function, that will be absolutely key. Uh, the chairman of, of the select committee, uh, Councillor Withers, uh, is, is present this morning. So it, this, you know, clearly for all of us, but also for Hampshire County Council's um, uh, oversight and scrutiny and internal governance is something uh, of huge interest at the moment. But I just reiterate, please uh, let us know uh, views. Um, that It's important that they're submitted. They are then taken into account as we go forward. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Simon, did you want to come in then as well? And I was just going to kind of bring the conversation back. Uh, obviously, it's a, a really important consultation, as others said, to respond. We also need to make sure we're focusing on the outcomes for uh, the population and actually where's the best place we can all spend our pound to get the best outcome for the population. And I think there's something about how do we turn that conversation around to make sure we all, and actually, you know, as Council Fair has for this consultation, we may decide it's in one place, but we may decide it's in another place. From our role, we're thinking about health and wellbeing. Thank you, Simon. Patricia. Thank you. I I had informally, so now I can formally ask the question. I did ask for a copy of the Equalities Impact Assessment for this consultation and the actual impact assessment. This follows on from uh, other comments around the potential impact on the wider system, that decisions taken at county, which trust me, I completely understand as a district council, we completely understand the requirement for savings, but we need to also be completely cognizant, as Matt has referenced, the impact on other parts of the system. So I've asked for a copy of the impact assessment associated with that. It does follow on from a comment that was made in the Frimley system that they, they thought that the proposals essentially hollow out 
uh, a number of those services and would have a significant impact on themselves. So if I can put a formal request for that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Samaya, you've just put something up, which I can't quite read on my screen. At That's the all right. I've just put both those consultations through Council Fairhurst if members want to access them. OK, thank you for that. Simon. Uh, just so the EIA is part of that pack for the public health consultation. Super. OK, right. Thank you, everyone. Um, moving on. I'd like to invite Richard to come and talk to us. We asked at the last meeting to have a, a, a fuller look at the Hampshire Nile of White integrated care system, and Richard's come along to present to us. Richard? Thank you, Councillor. Um, are you content if I, uh, I've shared a paper in advance, but are you content if I share a brief deck that brings you up to speed with where things are in a fast moving environment? Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. Bear with me whilst I just um, share. Um, so uh, here we are. And um, so uh, aim of today is really to bring the Health and Wellbeing Board up to date with the um, what is uh, in the NHS in England uh, commencing on its most ambitious reform program for a generation. Um, the ambition of the reform programme is to move away from a national network of, in some instances, subscale and fragmented payor and provider organisations and establishing in its place 43 regionally based integrated care systems. And there are also changes in the legislation associated with uh the the national uh national bodies and roles but but for the purpose of the health and well-being board i suspect that's the most material of of changes so each of these newly created integrated care systems will take on accountability for multi-year health outcomes and budgets for defined geographically contiguous populations um and uh you know they're operating on a new appointed leadership teams. Each ICS will control annual budgets for us of, of uh, £3 billion and secure care for a population of, of 1.8 uh, to 2 million people. And, and, and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't um, ignore the fact that this does represent a fundamental shift in how care is planned, delivered, funded and managed. So it's important. Um, it, it is important and it's one that we do need to take note of. Um, I, I think um, this is, uh, sorry it's a bit scrappy, uh, but this is uh, in, in essence what do health systems need to get right and the kind of philosophy, objectives and, and approaches of the future arrangements of integrated care systems. So uh, integrated care systems will be given four target outcomes, you can see it in the top, uh, they will be required to, to optimise health outcomes. And within that is a very significant focus on improving health outcomes, tackling inequalities um, for our population. Uh, secondly, is to create great patient experience and to ensure that we deliver constitutional standards around outcomes, quality, safety, and experience. Thirdly is making sure that we create a sustainable system. And fourthly, and this is really important and very relevant for the Health and Wellbeing Board, contribute to the social and economic growth of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And whilst we've uh, historically had an interest in that as a health partner, this, uh, uh, this um, expectation puts a clear statutory responsibility on the NHS to contribute to economic and social growth for the population. In order to do that for the NHS, uh, at, at health, it has to work very clearly as a health and care and broader system to keep people as healthy and independent as possible, uh, and also therefore to provide swift access to efficient high quality care for those who need it. Um, all of which is underpinned by a consistent drive around innovation and, and improvement. And, and you can see the enablers there, which, which have always been at the case. But I think um, just to draw out data analytics, 
technical and digital uh, innovation and in infrastructure will be key and research life sciences in partnerships are going to be fundamental to achieving that. So that's a little bit of a backdrop of um, of the journey we're on. Um, I, uh, I'll talk a little bit now about the ICS design framework, what it includes. Um, but before I do, I thought I just might bring you up to speed with where we sit at the moment today with regards to the legislation, the delivery, the transition programme and uh, next steps. So um, we originally anticipated that uh, the bill would be presented to the House um, in uh, May or June. We more latterly assumed the bill would be presented to the House yesterday, um, Wednesday. Um, the uh, arrival of the new Secretary of State for Health has meant that there is a, um, a short uh, uh, opportunity for the new Secretary of State to understand the proposed legislation and um, review his uh, review his approach to it. So we continue to await uh, an announcement about any changes potentially to the legislative timetable, but we um, we continue to anticipate that the bill will be presented to the House in July. Um, the original legislative timetable um, uh, anticipated the, the second reading of the bill would can, would take place before the 22nd of July and uh, parliamentary recess. Um, that's still a hope, but we would also recognise that that is a ferocious timetable uh, for uh, primary legislation and therefore uh, we need to um, uh, recognise there is an element of risk associated with that. Um, so um, we, uh, on the uh, 26th of June, we received, um, not 26th of June, sorry, um, uh, earlier in June, we received the first formal guidance issued around integrated care system, which was the ICS design framework. Um, and that design framework um, set out a series of um, uh, uh, guidance around the expectations that will sit within the legislation around the requirements for integrated care systems and the design uh, choices that may be able to be deployed within any uh, local integrated care system. Um, what I would say is that the design framework and the anticipated legislation presents quite a lot of uh, design choices. So it is quite permissive legislation and quite permissive guidance and allows therefore for local systems to um, make quite a lot of choice below the key statutory bodies of the ICS partnership and the ICS NHS body about how it goes about undertaking its strategic objectives and business. Um, and, and I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. So the uh, components of the ICS design framework you can see set out on that slide, um, the partnership, the NHS body, the process by which uh, we would build financial allocations, accountability, oversight, data, digital, et al. Um, the design framework trails guidance that will then subsequently follow in July, we anticipate that will provide more detail, examples and best practice associated with all of these indicators. So the design framework was effectively a precursor to um, detailed guidance that we anticipate over the course of the second quarter of the financial year. Um, but I will share with you um, each of the kind of key messages coming forward from that design guidance, if that's helpful. And, and uh, and uh, I'm really content for people to interrupt me as I go through, or I'm very happy to wait to the end for any specific questions. Um, so uh, the first thing and probably the most important thing for the Health and Wellbeing Board is the ICS partnership. So the ICS partnership uh, is described as a forum, but under legal terms will be a committee that will be um, will sit within statute and will be jointly uh, enacted by local authority and health partners um, with the uh, means to align ambitions with plans to integrate health uh, and care outcomes, improve outcomes for local people. 
you can see its ambition is to, is to drive forward a strategic um, plan for improving health and well-being for the population, um, moving upstream, influencing determinants of health and broader socioeconomic development. Um, it, it is a um, ambition to be built on bottom up, um, place based joint strategic needs assessment and ambitions driven by this health and wellbeing board. So it's not dictating what Hampshire's um, strategy is or actions to tackle health and wellbeing, but it is designed to ensure that the totality of health um, is able to both understand and lean into um, the Hampshire uh, health and wellbeing strategy but more broadly look for connect connectivity between Hampshire, Portsmouth, Southampton and the Isle of Wight places in order to ensure that we can leverage scaled impact and change around health and wellbeing priorities. Uh, interestingly, it looks to draw a wider community of partners than hitherto um, we have um, uh, consistently engaged with. And I think post COVID that's reaffirmed just the importance of um, the wider so social determinants of health, working with a range of economic, voluntary third sector um, partners, as well as our traditional public sector partners, in order to um, be clear about where we make the greatest impact on health and well-being and improving outcomes and reducing inequalities. Um, its job is to create an integrated uh, health and well-being strategy um, that will be effectively uh, passed on into the health sector for enactment by the ICS NHS body. Um, and within the design framework, for those of you who had an opportunity to review it, it talks a lot about the principles of inclusivity, uh, uh, propositions being founded on, uh, on, on um, a step change in engagement uh, and patient involvement. Um, and transparency around uh, understanding what people want and, uh, and how communities feel um, they want to access care and support to remain independent and drive well-being. Uh, and it's also founded on a principle of, um, of commitment and consensus. So it's not a job, it doesn't have a job in order to enact decisions unilaterally, it, it seeks to build consensus in order to get behind key strategies to improving health and well-being for the population. Um, so I'll pause there for a second. It's uh, it's fundamentally important, therefore, that um, the Health and Wellbeing Board and the public health teams feel absolute ownership in terms of shaping and directing the content of the ICS partnership, because it is designed as um, in essence, the scaled and um, the setting the scaled strategy for uh, tackling or improving health and well-being, including outcomes for our population across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, moving on more, more broadly, then we have the ICS NHS body, and, and this is again a statutory body, uh, and it is, uh, it is, um, will take on many of the responsibilities uh, that pri previously have been held by the number of clinical commissioning groups in operation across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Uh, and it's charged with bringing the NHS together to improve population health and care, delivering the four uh, outcomes that I alluded to earlier on. Um, it will um, uh, it will uh, enact the strategic plan developed by the ICS partnership. It's not a hierarchical relationship, so the partnership doesn't govern the ICS NHS body, but the ICS NHS body um, has to uh, has a role to enact the strategy that's set by the partnership. It also has uh, will determine how resources are allocated in line with the strategy set by the partnership um, oversee joint working arrangements, establish governance arrangements, take on new DT duties delegated from NHS England, including health and justice um, some of the screening responsibilities, uh, specialised services, planning, uh, and commissioning and some of the primary care so, um, responsibilities that currently are held by regions such as ophthalm, ophthalm, ophthalmology, dental, um, pharmacy, etc. Uh, fundamentally focused on uh, development people plan, so making sure that we are able to leverage real uh, change and support our people across health and, and care much more effectively, 
um, and undertakes scaled activities uh, around things like digital um, uh, and insight. Central to the ICS NHS body and its journey will be the um, prerequisite that the foundation is around population health management, tackling inequalities, uh, reducing outcomes. So um, there has never been a moment where the principles of well-being, upstreaming, prevention uh, and tackling inequalities has been more central to any piece of coming legislation and core functions um, that, than, uh, than I've ever uh, recalled in NHS's history. Um, you can, uh, I, I won't dwell on these, but in the design guidance you can see that there is a minimum set of requirements around the ICS NHS body um, that, that requires a chair, a chief exec, at least two non-execs, three, um, a number of executive roles, including a finance director, a chief medical officer, a chief nursing officer. And it requires um, three partner representatives, one from the provider sector in the NHS, one from general practice and one from drawn from local authority. These individuals will be uh, members and therefore will have to account for decisions made at the board. Um, so they're not playing a representative at the table, but non-voting, they will be accountable for decisions taken uh, alongside other board members. Um, we uh, await guidance around constitution, appointments, processes, et al. Um, and we don't anticipate those will be released until the second reading of the bill, hopefully in July, if not in um, September. Um, it uh, also requires us to um, make clear how decisions and functions will be deployed, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, and requires us to now move to make a far more structured arrangement uh, in partnership with the voluntary community and social enterprise sector, so that we're putting that onto a much more um, clear and sustainable footing in the health sector. Um, and you can see the uh, reiterating the principles about one workforce approach um, across uh, where possible health and care. Um, the uh, one of the big wins from the development of clinical commissioning groups and indeed in in the development of uh, NHS partners uh, and social care has been the empowerment of clinicians and professionals as key decision makers. And again, reiterate it's great to see clinical leadership represented on the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, here today. The a core design principle of the future of the integrated care system will be retaining clinical and care professional leadership at the heart of decision making processes um, uh, moving forward. Um, and we do, and it's really relevant for the Health and Wellbeing Board, also need to work with democratically elected representatives to understand how we ensure that the role of the democratically elected representative is, is discharged as part of the integrated care system governance and decision making framework. Uh, and that's why we have to uh, map and understand how that will be uh, appropriately and effectively discharged. Um, uh, finance, uh, we will be given a, a single allocation for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, we will see, we anticipate there'll be changes to procurement roles. So a shift from a procurement by default to potentially a um, provider selection regime, which might allow the integrated care system to make decisions uh, out with a traditional procurement based approach. Um, the ICS uh, will likely be empowered to develop alternative arrangements for financial flows, moving away from a market based fee for service model to potentially value based outcomes, uh, value based contracts, looking at improving outcomes over a longer period of time um, and ensuring that capital allocations are made to the ICS body uh, and again enabling more strategic investment in the capital infrastructure across health and care as opposed to um, individual organisational based capital allocations. Um, the role of providers in an integrated care system uh, is seen as fundamental and, and this is particularly for um, 
uh, it, they're seen now as, as how they lead the delivery and transformation of care. The view is that the separation of commissioning and provision in the service design model in CCGs and the enactment of those contracts through providers didn't lead to the step change in outcomes and experience uh, that we're looking for. So it's very much a how do we engage with uh, providers to lead delivery and transformation of care. Um, uh, drawn into the centre to help establish priorities and shared plans. Um, each of the provider organisations in the NHS are uh, being encouraged, indeed required, to identify uh, where they wish to work together as part of a new phrase called provider collaborative in order to improve quality, improve efficiency, reduce cost um, and improve outcomes for local people and um, colleagues in the room are working through opportunities for working together in provider collaboratives as we move forward. And again, a restatement about primary care. Primary care, as we know, are fundamental to the models of care that we develop, both in terms of prevention and delivery. Um, but of course, primary care is a um, is a very large and, and widely distributed community, and therefore we have to think more creatively about how primary care are consistently involved in all levels of decision making, which is slightly different to um, other clinical professional roles who, who sit under probably a more structured uh, engagement in decision making processes. Um, and then finally, and, and, and um, probably most importantly, the, uh, the ICS design framework and the anticipated legislation will reaffirm the centrality of place um, it does allow us to locally define what we mean by place, but for the purposes of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight um, to date, and I anticipate moving forward, we would define place as our local authority footprint. So Hampshire, Portsmouth, Southampton and the Isle of Wight. Um, and the, the ambition is that, that places and place based partnerships continue to understand the needs of the population. Um, plan and design services um, that meet the needs of this population, either in terms of keeping those people living independently at, at, in health and well-being, or in terms of um, meeting specific needs, including tackling inequalities experienced by these individuals in terms of access, experience and outcome. Um, and they are the fora through which we would drive local integration of partners. They should involve, as you see, the gamut of um, arrangements and, and we have flexibility, as I alluded to earlier on, about how we will frame the relationship between the ICS and our local authority partners and NHS provider partners in describing what are the responsibilities that are delegated collectively to those places. Um, but, uh, but the ambition of partners broadly across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight is that we should evolve our arrangements based on our current um, current system rather than fundamentally uh, changing in, in the short term uh, because of the development of trust, confidence and relationships between partners um, uh, across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. So that's a, a, a whistle stop tour of where we are uh, with regards to the national programme, with regards to what is an integrated care system. Uh, we uh, are again working now with all partners to start to understand levels of ambition, baseline what is currently in place that we need to build upon as opposed to losing the transition and we'll start to engage over the second quarter with um, uh, democratically elected representatives, local authority partners or wider partners around how do we make the most is an unprecedented opportunity in health uh, to contribute more effectively as a partner in driving improved outcomes for our population. Right, right. Thank, thank you, Richard. Richard. Um, um, can I ask uh, Anne, uh, I know you put something in the, the chat room, if Anne's there. Yes, uh, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I see the ICS is becoming 
more community focused. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not, but certainly with the integration of um, social care, it tends to suggest they'll be more community focused. And if that's the case, would the overall budget reflect that? Um, so I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask individuals who are central to this um, this question to answer it. There is no doubt that history would suggest that we have long held an ambition to invest in prevention, promotion, supporting community and person resilience in the home setting, as opposed to reactive treatment based services, because we know that that's uh, poor outcomes for the individual and less efficient use of our resources. But um, as I go back to the start, I suspect one of the reasons that we have struggled to leverage a shift in our resources towards prevention, promotion, community mental health, uh, supporting independence and well-being has been we've uh, we've had a complex system of uh, organisation, complex interaction between uh, market-based models, uh, payment systems haven't always lent themselves to that, uh, and long-term planning hasn't always lent itself. We've tended to kind of fall into some traps occasionally of um, of having to respond very rapidly to uh, levels of demand in secondary care. That's not to diminish the this importance of, of continued investment in secondary care because we get great outcomes from investment, but it is uh, signalling that we do have an explicit strategy to shift our investment in supporting people living independently in their home setting. And, and therefore, um, the integrated care system uh, will, I'm sure, confidently be setting an objective that says we would want to ensure that we rebalance investment um, to, to support that strategic aim. Um, but I, I'm conscious that um, You've got uh, many partners in the room who will be part of that um, live conversation as we speak. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Matt. Uh, th thanks, Richard, for the presentation and for your comments about clinical leadership, which are kind. Um, uh, without wishing to to kind of reopen the previous conversation, I mean, you, you, you've mentioned that um, ICS is aim to reduce inequality and um, address uh, prevention and, and health promotion. And um, as, as we've discussed, uh, and you also mentioned that there's a single budget um, across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, but, but that budget is an NHS budget, isn't it? And so the, the local authority budget that we've talked about earlier, how do, how do we include that, that kind of important health promotion work, which is currently funded via a different route. Is there a way of um, including that more holistically within the work of the ICS? Do you, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, Richard. Um, so I, I uh, so we do we do already, as you know, pool elements of spend between health and local government. Um, uh, and certainly there is an ambition across all um, partner organisations across the four local authorities and from health to increase the scope and scale of that pooled arrangement. Um, but uh, uh, but we can only move, uh, the, the pace of change has to be proportionate to uh, maintaining stability of our existing systems. We won't be rewarded for um, making very, very large shifts and therefore leaving some of our costs and, and services uh, unsustainable or untenable in the very, very short term. And um, what, what is evident is that integrated care systems will need to become more sophisticated nationally about understanding the needs of the population at a granular level, forecasting the presentation uh, of, um, of those needs moving forward and making sure we align our capacity um, much more dynamically to responding to those needs. For uh, as an example of that, and I share this as a thought process, I don't believe yet across um, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, we truly understand the legacy health debt associated with the last 18 months of um, COVID. I don't think we know it yet. I think we can hypothesise the individuals who might have developed a health debt associated with the 
deterioration in long-term condition or the uh, absence of ongoing support or treatment, but we don't yet know what that debt might look like and how it might present over the course of the next two to three years. And, and we will need to move ourselves into that place in order to ensure that we are aligning, understanding that, and then aligning our resources in order to support those individuals um, explicitly in order to make sure that health debt doesn't translate into um, materially poorer outcomes. And, and I think we, there's no complacency anywhere, as we've seen in Manchester, the reporting of the the premature mortality and, and uh, reduction in life expectancy of the poorest individuals in Manchester uh, report in the last 24, 48 hours, which is a salutary reminder that um, our ability to operate in the space we need to get to will require us to fundamentally build a capacity around insight, understanding, and then a dynamic ability to move resources forward. Um, I think, therefore, one of the characteristics of a high performing integrated care system, to come back to your question, Matt, is um, no individual organisation should have to be in a position to be taking decisions um, without the support, engagement and input of its partners, where the impact on the citizen could be mitigated or ameliorated. Um, and that, and that, that sounds a bit of a diplomatic expression. But the purpose of the integrated care system is to look holistically at the person and understand what the best thing to do for the person is and how, therefore, we take all actions to mitigate risk where any one individual organisation is presented with a set of circumstances, be it financial workforce or others, that will present um, a net um, deterioration in outcome for the local population. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Simon. You've been waiting very patiently. Not at all. Uh, just a, a couple of points. So one is that absolutely, as Richard said, Drex Public Health and the three of us working across the four authorities working really closely and have uh, developed plans for the NHS to take forward prevention. So that really clearly states out what as a local authority and as a partnership board here we can do. Uh, and we are doing that. So there are really strong prevention plans in place. But it's really, as Richard said, how we shift that focus of the NHS we know, for example, you know, we spend an awful lot of money. I'm not even going to give a pound sign to orthopaedic surgery. But how do we shift a small proportion of that into physical activity? Not just because Julie's on the call. Uh, but, you know, we know physical activity uh, may actually reduce the need for orthopaedic surgery if we intervene at the right level. So how do we really move that forward? Um, I, you know, I've been talking about this for so many years, yet actually we haven't seen a shift of that money to even think about physical activity. And just as a pre uh, kind of um, a prequel for the JSNA paper later on, talking exactly as Richard said, uh, we are doing that so we understand the health of the population uh, impact of COVID and going forward. So I'll talk about that later on uh, this morning. Thank you, Simon. Graham. Yeah, th thank you. I, I want to pick up, if I can, a couple of themes that have already been uh, mentioned and asked. The first thing that I wanted to do was just to, to underline we are a health and wellbeing board. And well-being uh, being the, the the critical phrase here. I'm I'm going to get this wrong because I can't remember the precise uh, uh, distribution of this. But um, there, there's some work in terms of of what contributes to the well-being of our population, and the delivery of of clinical health services. I think account for around about 30% of what makes up, in a more rounded holistic sense, that experience of well-being. And the other point I just wanted to make, and this is where I, I touch on a theme or, or already covered. Um, if we think as a board about us collectively seeking to add value by doing more stuff together and doing stuff differently and just returning, not going there uh, practically, but just returning to the previous conversation around a public health con consultation. I've heard Richard say before that a pound saved in local government equates to seven pounds spent in the NHS. And if we think about our broad set of ambitions as a health and well-being board, uh, the first one is starting well. So there is something here returning to Matt's question and comment. What do we as a leadership community for health and well-being need to do differently as we go forward? Thank you very much indeed. If I, if, if I may, so, so I think just to add to that, so so I, I'd commend a PwC Health Research Institute report. It might be worth really helpful required reading because it, it 
uh, just to quote from it, even the most advanced medical interventions are rendered ineffective when people struggle with social isolation, income inequality, um, poor nutrition and pollution. Clinical care accounts for only 20% of a person's health, health behaviours, physical environment, socioeconomic conditions, determining the remaining 80%. So your postcode matters far more than your genetic code. Um, and and that's, that's effectively the job of an integrated care system is not to be cavalier about, is to not, um, is to, to absolutely maintain access to high quality, going back to that kind of table at the start, absolutely maintain access to the to world-class treatment-based services, but not at the expense of supporting the development of people living, uh, tackling the kind of wider socioeconomic determinants of health and um, tackling the 80% of the postcode as opposed to the genetic code. Right, thank you, Richard. Uh, and thank you, Graham. Patricia. Just leading on from that, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it would seem, to, you know, following on the conversation about the consultation uh, on public health, from what everything that Graham and Richard have both said, it would sound like actually we need to have a broader conversation about pooling of budgets for public health don't we? But that wasn't the point I actually put my hand up for. Uh, my point I, I, I put my hand up for, and uh, Richard, um, you may be surprised by this, but nobody else on the call will be surprised by this at all, and what is happening in the Frimley system. <laughs> because unfortunately, when you use the, the phraseology Hampshire, it is shorthand for the Hampshire boundary system of the ICS. This board is a health and wellbeing board for Hampshire, which is 11 districts. The Hampshire ICS does not represent all of those 11 districts and I, and I actually want to register an objection to this report because in the minutes of the meeting from the last meeting it specifically said the Hampshire Isle of Wight ICS and Frimley ICS will need to ensure co-production to get it right from all perspectives and this report does not reference the Frimley system in any way shape or form. I appreciate that it's a strategic report and therefore the strategy position will be the same but in using the shorthand Hampshire all the way through that report you negate the fact it completely ignores what's happening in Rushmore and half of heart so Richard what's happening in Frimley and um, thank you Councillor Hughes and, and you know uh, it will be um, I, I won't be uh, in any way patronising to say you know, other than apologising in to say that I use Hampshire as the footprint of Hampshire County Council as opposed to any other um, construct, because I think I recognise that as a process and the Hampshire Health and Wellbeing Board again is defined by the Hampshire Local Authority. With, with regards to the Frimley system, we as an integrated care system, as you know, don't serve the whole of Hampshire. We serve uh, 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 most, but not all in the 200,000 population uh, the sort of the friendly system we've been a, a incredibly active partner in support of the firmly integrated care systems options appraisal around the future which is currently subject to review and a decision imminently from the new secretary of state as to the boundaries associated with the future statutory integrated care systems um, we, uh, irrespective of the outcome, will work um, with the um, uh, work with uh, our partners uh, across any boundary, actually, in order to ensure we implement and deliver a, uh, a set of proposals which are um, cognizant of the local geography, cognizant of the relationship with um, uh, partners, including district, uh, district and borough. Uh, partners to make sure that they're fully involved and engaged in that and we are um, we are actively signaling to uh, through NHS England and through to the Secretary of State's office that um, we consider it a, a risk now uh, around the delays associated with the decision um, uh, decision has to be taken in order to allow for a full engagement and involvement of, of partnerships on the future development arrangements, irrespective of what Secretary of State's decision is, um, not knowing is, is becoming a risk. Richard, if I can just have a quick reflection, if people will bear with me just for one moment. Um, there is a lot more work going on around the creation of place and governance in, to, to the best of my knowledge, in the Frimley system, because I'm heavily engaged in that. 
And as I referenced before, Richard, you weren't on this call, so I will say it again. Uh, Hart District Council feels like a polar bear on two separate um, blocks of ice with it. Blocks of ice are traveling away from each other. And I put a plea out last time that we never see a report coming through to this, this board, which does not completely encompass the entirety of the boundary of the Hampshire system. And I'd ask that we bring that back to this board and, and make sure that when we talk about ICS systems, it's a truly encompassing and we can see where the challenges are associated with different decisions being made around governance and place in those two different spaces. And, and so my personal commitment is that any future report I bring back to this board will, will uh, be done in a co-production way with my colleagues in Frimley, I was working with the Frimley, my opposite number and Frimley yesterday, keeping up to pace with their development models around uh, their system development plan. So uh, we are heavily engaged and are now awaiting the outcome of the decision so that we can progress on within that understanding. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. Um, I uh, acknowledge what you're saying about um, Frimley, um, Patricia, and um, it's difficult that we don't know the answer to the uh, uh, consultation yet. However, um, I want to go back really to um, the two tier system we have in Hampshire. And actually, you've already pointed out the, the districts that we have within Hampshire. And of course, this work has to be built from the ground up. And quite a lot of what we're doing around prevention and working with partners takes time to build trust and it takes time to um, deliver. Uh, and, and I think that the um, working upstream on population health management um, and working to um, uh, improve delivery on health inequalities, the 8020 that um, Richard has just pointed out from the PwC report, um, will take time to deliver and here we are all with a fixed budget across our integrated care system um, which has to spread also across the um, three other health and wellbeing boards within the system across the Isle of Wight, across Portsmouth and across Southampton and so um, being the only um, place in Hampshire where we have got a two-tier system we do need to remember that Hampshire County Council has to work well with its districts to deliver at place um, and uh, uh, and really working from the ground up, something that will take a long time. It's very easy for us to say uh, we want to change the way we look and we want to change the way we work, we want to work on prevention, but it's going to take 10 or more years to become uh, efficient and effective to actually make that deliver financially and to deliver outcomes for our patients and, and I just wonder how well we feel we can work in Hampshire um, right from the ground up in the wards in the districts in the boroughs to make this work um, with our health colleagues and our colleagues in the voluntary sector um, as this, this is going to be the way that the ICS will will be able to write some of the health inequalities that have developed, particularly become start through COVID. Thank you, Barbara. Richard, do you want to come back on that? No, I, other than to kind of commend Barbara's, uh, we we've raised uh, we've raised the conversation. How do we make those connections where they are incredibly meaningful and continue to reinforce relationships between district? Uh, and borough authorities, con groupings of primary care networks, Hampshire County Council, the um, to leverage real change where it makes sense for local populations. Um, and, and we are committed to finding ways in which those local communities are able to really shape and leverage resources that meet the needs of the population. Um, and that's one of the design characteristics that we're committed to moving forward is, is how do we ensure that that the principle of subsidiarity um, continues to be uh, framed in any proposals moving forward. And also, how do we work with our counterparts in the other three health and wellbeing boards? Completely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Peter. Um, thank you, Councillor Furhurst. I, 
I guess I, I guess it's just important to acknowledge what Patricia said earlier. You know, I work in the primary system. This is quite a live topic. Um, I hear the anxieties and 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 the difficulties that we're all going through. And my point was focused around not just the Frimley and Hampshire kind of interface, but a much more of a wider point. And Richard, you alluded to it in your presentation around the need to invest in our people uh, with clinical and professional leadership. And I think that there's a big leadership um, ask on all of us really to step up to that. And, and, and I would like to seek the assurance of the board that uh, we do not make any assumptions on existing relationship building, but we proactively and intentionally uh, encourage um, the new ways of working across those two systems and actually within the Hampshire system. Uh, we've heard earlier, Councillor Fairhurst, you've given acknowledgement to lots of people moving on, whether clinicians, uh, uh, elected members or uh, executives, and there'll be new colleagues coming in. So I think there is just something around creating a space for us to get to know each other, develop uh, relationships built on the evolving um, ICS and, uh, and and just not to make any assumptions that those relationships uh, are, 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 you know, do not need nurturing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, and, and the second very quick point, uh, there is a risk that as the uh, as this evolves, that ultimately patient care will be affected. And I'd like us as a board to absolutely ensure that we take proactive steps to mitigate against those risks. So we're not just looking on the future, but actually the here and now and the ability to continue to deliver for our local population. Right. Thank you, Peter. And I completely take on board about building relationships. And hopefully by the time of our next meeting, we will all be able to meet in person. And that will be a much easier task than just seeing faces on a screen. And hopefully we can look at some development work. The new members. Thank you. Uh, Philip. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it, building, I think, on what a lot of people have said, including Barbara in particular, there's very little in this that most of us won't recognise from other proposed ways ahead. There is no doubt, and history has taught us, this is not going to be quick. It's going to take time, and as Barbara said, 10, 12 years. I, I'm just slightly nervous at whether we actually have 10 or 12 years. It, my sense is that you, the public recognise a huge debt to the NHS over the last 18 to 24 months. But equally, I, I get a strong sense that there's an increasing resentment about some aspects of how, how healthcare has been delivered. Uh, Richard talked about the health debt, which is yet to be quantified and more visible. Uh, and I think people are beginning to get um, slightly resentful that they're not in control or charge. And we all talk about our NHS, but I think, especially in the media, there's an increasing feeling that that's nice phraseology, but it's not necessarily there in practice. I was delighted to see earlier on, Richard, provide clear mechanisms for engaging with people in the communities. He didn't then go on to give any detail at this stage of how well that is going to work. Uh, I think it's incredibly important if you're going to take the public with you with these changes that that's right up front and centre. Because I think if we don't deliver this over the next five to ten years, I, I think there might be an increasing call for something really radical on the whole healthcare delivery system which certainly at this moment in time isn't some place I think any of us would like to go. But I think this is almost the last chance for the NHS as we know it to get it right. So we have to engage the people and truly engage them and listen to them. I would just add one, one thing. You know, with the bringing together of the five CCGs, lots of the community engagement committees and the rest have felt increasingly distant and remote. And that's just one example of where I think the public feel they've been pushed back from genuinely getting involved with changing their health service. Thank you. Thank you for that. Richard? No, I, I think, Councillor Raffaele, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I think um, we will undoubtedly, we are already experiencing a post-COVID 
anxiety, ex expression of anxiety and concern from from communities and populations, and uh, and it beholds us as a health and care and a wider partnership to 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 not bury our heads and say it's all good, but to confront and and address those issues head on. And I I do think um, we whilst we have to build a kind of local place based and subsidiarity model, we also have to professionalise and scale some of the activities that we do. Um, uh, we need to do more effectively. So if I think of the, the heralding, the, the transformative nature of digital over the course of the last 18 months, which, which has been transformational in the way in which individuals have been able to stay in connected with the health and care system safely, um, it has left a legacy and residual in some communities of a sense of not proper, not proper access, not proper connectivity. Now, um, contrast that with the majority of people who consider the way in which they are able to stay on top of their finances or their other elements of life and consider it to be normalised and understand it. In health, it's seen as a temporary fix. Whilst we return back to a world of uh, of everything being face to face and driven by content, and and that's not that's that's in part driven by a kind of fragmented deployment approach but also in part driven by the absence of proper engagement inclusion activation with our community so people understand what how and the benefits associated with rather than the rather than the challenges so so you're um amongst the characteristics that integrated care systems have to make a step change is that health and I'll call out health as opposed to local government health have to become dramatically more effective around patient and citizen involvement engagement and activation and that's a phrase that we're now using how do we activate and support the individual to take greater ownership and control of their their health and care and, and well-being needs so so that that's bang on and 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 if there's any assurance the that's an understood approach and, and how we build partnerships to do that more effectively is, is priced into the ICS development process because you can't, you can't become functional as a system unless you do that and we do that consistently and effectively throughout. Um, so so that, that's one and then the, the other is, um, the other issue I would kind of just reflect on is um, how do we how do we make sure that we're more sophisticated ensuring that individuals are able to access the care they need more rapidly as opposed to allowing some uh, creating a system that requires some people to wait longer than others where the outcome and impact is is disadvantageous or disproportionately poorer for those individuals and that cycles back to simon's point which is we can now do it as part of a just struggle to do it around a person-centered care um, and so how do we make sure that that makes it far more meaningful for individuals? So uh, when you have a great experience in health, you, you tend to be less challenging than if you read it on the front page of the Express and, or, or other newspapers. So our job is to create great experiences for individuals um, so that they aggregate into a kind of sense of great outcomes and great perspectives because there is going to be a lot of change inevitably over the course of the next four to five years. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Julie. I can see Christine wa waving a hand. Is that because you wanted to follow up on what Richard was talking about? No, Chris well, I've had, Chris I've had Christine down to speak after you for some Fine. time, so I don't think it relates to the last question. Yeah. Great. OK, I'm go I'll keep my point short because some of them have, me have been made. But the first one is in relation to the point that you made, Richard, in your presentation around um, the voluntary sector and the government's arrangements about that. I wasn't really clear as to whether the voluntary sector would be included in those um, governance arrangements in, in a, a, an equal way, in, in a sense, as, as members of, of the board or whether it was that the point that was made on the because I haven't got a copy of the presentation in front of me that whether it was almost likely be finding some way to connect to the voluntary sector 
Um, I'll, I'll give you a chance to answer that in a moment, but, I, but my point would be on, on behalf of the voluntary sector is that I think it's really important that within the integrated care system that we are building the voluntary sector into the governance arrangements at every level, because if we've not learned anything over the last 18 months, um, then it has been the importance of the voluntary sector in, in this um, in, in the health system, but also in place, which brings me to my second point about place. And when we spoke about place in relation to the three unitary authorities and Hampshire, place is not the three unitary um, authorities and Hampshire, as um, Tricia has always already um, mentioned as well. But it relates to Simon's point in, in the chat of those areas of most need, which can be um, not at even a borough level could actually be in a ward or even at a street level. And I think we've got to think about place in, in, the, in this care system in, in a, a, a much more focused way, I guess. Um, and, the, and the third area for me would be around the, uh, the building in the data sharing so that the system can become more agile in its response to whether it is the health deficit that's um, that, that's been created over the last 18 months or whether it's other things that we've not really spotted coming on the horizon. Um, and I'm, I'm not I know that that's been a problem through uh, in, in some cases through the pandemic, but it's definitely something that we should be looking for that collective um, data sharing insight so that we can be responsive as um, a, a system. Thank you. Um, shall I respond to those three really quickly? Um, so the first one, the voluntary sector. So um, voluntary sector absolutely envisaged. We haven't yet seen the final guidance, uh, Julie, but absolutely envisaged to be a core partner of the ICS partnership, designing the strategy for health and well-being uh, for the population of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, we uh, we uh, and similarly within place-based partnerships. The voluntary sector are absolutely identified as um, envisaged to be a core partner of place-based partnerships and, and around the table around how um, places developed. And I, and I and I were just concluding our mapping of our current place-based arrangements or our place-based partnerships, and and it looks as if voluntary sector are, are fully engaged or deeply engaged in in those arrangements to date, and we would be. Um, we've given commitments not to move back from the kind of current levels of, of inclusivity in, in those arrangements. With regards to the ICS NHS body, the, the, uh, the, the ICS design framework talks of um, the ICS NHS body needing to form a, uh, a much more quantified relationship with the voluntary sector. Now that that's shy of, I think, having a formal seat on the IC, NHS ICS body because um, but I think that but it does mean that there will be a formal kind of agreement and uh, and structured array relationship with the voluntary uh, community and social enterprise sector that is able to um, ensure sustainability and and a kind of sense of input uh, and sh how the VSC sector is able to shape um, shape the strategic and operational deliveries and move forward. Um, so that was question one on the on the place question itself. You, you're right. Place is such an awful world word, isn't it? The nomenclature gets in the way everywhere because what is a place? Place is frankly, place could be my high street. It could be, you know, the three, the hamlet. It could be a county council authority. We've we've tended to try because everybody uses place interchangeably, and the the guidance is starting to use place. Um, Although non-specifically, we've 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 orientating ourselves to 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 keep the nomenclature relatively simple. To talk about our our places at the moment being built around our four local authorities, but but recognising that within that there will be a vast array of communities of neighbourhoods of where we will need to discharge very very specific sets of relationships, and we see the relationship between primary care networks and those core community teams uh, build around those populations of 20 to 30,000 as being instrumental in um, in leveraging this kind of experiential and outcome impact on those very those relatively small populations, albeit there will inevitably be communities that, that aren't geographically bounded but are 
characteristic bounded uh, and and therefore we also need to be avoiding a geographic definition of community and thinking as well of individuals with particular characteristics that we need to ensure they don't uh, experience poor outcomes or or uh, poor access so um i would I, I would just signal that for the simplicity of nomenclature it might be easier for us to talk of our relationship with our local authority upper tiers but not diminish the work that we would do in um, neighbourhoods and communities um, more specifically thereafter. And there was one other question, and I'm, I, I wrote down place twice, so it was so important. It was just on the um, importance of building in data sharing, but if I can just come back, if I may, Chairman, just on that first point about the government's arrangements. I, I suppose what I, I'd be saying is that I think we can be a bit more amb ambitious than the de minimis of, you know, uh, what the guidance says, I think, in the spirit of uh, the work of uh, within the system, that we recognise how important the voluntary sector is to the system, and therefore it, it should be, you know, have some kind of parity. I think uh, it, 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 within the governance arrangements. Yeah. I, 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 so, Julie, it's our job to to do this. All I suspect I was doing was just signalling that's what the guidance says at the moment um, and uh, and we'll need to co-produce the proposition for Hampshire and Gala as we move forward. I, I think it's important to note, if I can, um, this is a complex statutory, change of statutory bodies, bringing together a lot of moving parts. This won't be concluded by the 1st of April 2022, so the safe transitional elements will happen if individuals are employed by organisation X, we'll transition them to organisation Y and we'll have the core architecture enabled with a kind of terms of reference. But this will be, as I think Barbara has alluded to, this will be, or Councillor Raffaele alerted us to, hopefully a short and paced programme, but certainly not just uh, concluded by April the 1st, 2022. This will be something that we need to build and develop over the course of the next three to four years in order to meet uh, the ambitions, uh, what is the most ambitious reform in, in a generation. Right, thank you, Richard. Before I come to Christine, can I just go back to Paula? You put something in the chat about the, the survey you're doing about the clinical effectiveness. Do you know when that will be ready? And are you willing to bring that to the board and share it with us? Yeah, certainly will do. Um, I, I'm not sure on the dates, but I know we were involved with Oxford Health and also with, I think it was um, South London and Wardsley. Um, Carl Marlow was originally leading on it. So I'll, I'll get an update on it and I'm very happy to share it if it's something we think that would be of value to be seen. Yeah, that would be good. Thank you. Right, Christine. Hello. Uh, thanks, Julie. As it happened, my what I had been asking to say for a long time was, in fact, directly also related to Philip's point. Um, I feel I'm in despair right? <laughs> because um, Philip makes an incredibly good point about the need for the public to be backing the NHS. And what do we get back? We get a reply which equates public backing for the NHS and public engagement and co-design, we get a reply which is all about, we in the NHS have to improve our communication so that everybody agrees that we're providing a good service and completely individualised. I've been spending the last five or six years on this board stressing over and over again <laughs> that yes, of course, people want to be involved in their individual treatment, but also we have to have members of the public built in at the top level with co-design, joint planning, joint strategic thinking. And the people who will lead a revolt against the NHS are the people who think at the strategic level. It's not the people, it, uh, they will then recruit the people who are pissed off because they can't get a den dental appointment. But we have to think strategically and we have to include people at the top level. And I'm reading this paper and there is not one word in the document about uh, partnership with patients and partnership with service users or carers. There, yes, it mentions partnerships, but it mentions partnerships with other providers provider bodies. Richard, 
I don't want a long answer. I don't want a lot of explanation. I don't want you to say, oh, this is all too difficult for the little heads of the public. What I want to know is a one sentence answer. On which of these bodies are you going to have patient and public representatives? So the ICS NHS partnership central will be patient public involvement and patient and public representatives. So that's that's built into the expect minimum expectation, uh, and uh, and you know I I, I agree with ninety eight percent of everything you say, Christine. But I I will say throughout today I have signalled that the centrality of strategic operational and tactical citizen engagement is something that the NHS has to fundamentally up its game. And I've said it probably about five times. Uh, and if I didn't say it in direct response to Councillor Raffaelli's question. It was simply because I think I'd said it enough or too many times in the prior to that. Um, so I was thinking about what are the drivers for what is irritating, what are causing concerns amongst the community. Um, but but I'll say it again for the principles of, of today. How the NHS engages with citizens, with patients uh, and activates individuals as well as engage is fundamental to the integrated care system and, and the NHS has to fundamentally improve its approach to how it does that and is committed to doing that and we've building the capacity and capability so to do and working with the partnerships on that basis as we move forward uh, as well as the statutory requirements to engage citizens and citizen representative groups in the ICS partnership and then uh, and then uh, give mind to at all decision points how how citizens and patients are engaged in. I don't entirely consider that an answer. Uh, but I should shut up because the meeting's been going. Thank you, Christine. Um, Steve, again, you've been waiting a long, long time. That's quite all right. Uh, and uh, apologies, I had to dip out of the meeting for a little bit, but um, I'm back now. So it's possible this my question might have been answered or my comment may, may have been answered, but um, it won't surprise you, given my role, just, just that I'm going to say that um, children don't feature largely in any ICS document, either national or, or local. It's it, it, it's a, it's been a feature of this throughout. Um, I have uh, through my professional association, we're pressing very hard on government on this issue. And my understanding is that there may be some revised guidance uh, with regards to this in relation to ensuring that at the governance level, there is a nominated children's person within the ICS governance arrangements. Um, that may or may not happen, but my question and plea is, even if it doesn't happen from government, why, why wouldn't we do that anyway? Um, Steve, so you right from the outset, we've called out the absence of a focus on children in the legislation and these arrangements, I think in, HSJ, we hear um, today again a challenge associated with the to the Prime Minister around the absence of children's services moving forward. I think it's been a significant challenge right from the outset that children's potentially are risked. Um, I think the point to make, Steve, is it's not my decision as to whether they are in or out. It's a collective partnerships decision. So, so, but I think it's something that we will need to work on, and I'll take that forward in the design process over the next quarter to make sure that that perspective is brought in and if if that's the agreement of the partnership that's what we ought to do then then um that's the case and that that's not a fudged word steve but i couldn't make a commitment now because it's not my decision to make if that makes sense that's fine thank you steve uh simon did you put your hand down again or is it still up no it's down it's down okay patricia Yes, I was hope, hoping what I was going to say is going to be helpful, which is, Richard, I think a, a lot of the commentary has come about because we don't understand how we can engage in the process. There's an awful lot of conversation about what could happen and the ambitions and the hopes and the aspirations, but not actually how we're going to be engaged in the conversation, whether that's the public, whether that's the CVSs, whether it's the and the broader charitable sector, whether that's the local district councils. I think the, abs the issue is the absence sort of of any form yeah. of engagement with us to have a conversation around the co-production. There you go, Christine, I got it in. 
uh, around creation of that play system because my understanding from the consultation documents quite a lot of variability uh, or, or opportunity for us to build our place as we want to see it. So Richard, when will that plan come through? Because again, if I reference the Frimley system, we're on the third or fourth workshop associated with what place looks like and what governance looks like. And as yet, I'm not aware of a similar schedule and schema for people to come around these, these issues to actually have their say in that conversation so hopefully it's helpful if you yeah, can no, it's, it's very it's right to deliver some of that it's very helpful so so patricia i'll um following this meeting we'll share the kind of development plan as we move forward um we've been working with each place as you can imagine each of the four local authority footprints have been working extensively about about their ambitions and visions for the future and we've been engaging in development processes with each of those, be it the Isle of Wight, Portsmouth, Southampton uh, and Hampshire, around understanding their ambitions uh, whilst baselining what goes on at the moment uh, and awaiting the kind of final guidance to ensure that we are going to be developing processes in, and processes that are consistent. As we move into July through to July, September, October, there's a series of engagement events with each of the places. Um, with a culmination in September and October with a series of whole system workshops around um, drawing together the kind of local place and local system based ambitions uh, around testing uh, arrangements and that will include working with democratic elected representatives around how they see um, how they wish to see their role and involvement in the process as well as working with um, community partners, citizen engagement, CVSs and others around how they uh, how we want to construct the partnership arrangements, etc. So, um, so uh, we're happy with just kind of concluding that process off the back of the baseline work uh, that we've done and drawing together the local development activities that have been going on in each of our four places and local delivery systems over the course of the last uh, three months or so. So happy to share that uh, as part of an ongoing opportunity to be engaged uh, and co-produce a kind of outcome by the end of uh, this financial year. Thank you, Richard. Roz, in, in, in the chat, you were saying that more work needs to be done. Has Richard part, part, partly answered your question or is there anything else you'd like to see happen? No, I mean, obviously, I'm working with, with Richard on this, but I just think the points are so good in here and I think it's our duty ourselves to come up with some of these solutions. So. You know, it's not just Richard who had to come up with the answers, it's sort of us, isn't it? So I sort of think, how do we collectively, because all these amazingly brilliant points from the voluntary sector, focus on more community services, citizen engagement, um, the children's bit, but it's how do we do it collectively? Because it can't just be Richard on his own because that will never be the best answer, will it? However great he is at doing this. So I think it's how we do it together so how do we use the health and well-being board how do we use the infrastructure that we already have to really embed this a lot more so i think that's the bit for me it's a collective it's a collective um responsibility that we can get right together if we all if we all use this forum and pull together on it right thank you richard Bearing in mind everything that's been said, I think you've had a thorough going over, if you like. And so thank you for your time. And if you're willing to come back to us, did you say October? Well, I think it'd be great to keep this on the agenda as we move forward. Yeah. Uh, um, and if I may, I mean, as Ross says, brilliant questions, brilliant points mm -hmm. in a design process. There are never, it's easy, isn't it, to jump to want to know the answers, but in a co-productive process, they've, they need to be built on um, everyone's input. I, I would cycle back to say the opportunities associated with this change are extraordinary. And that's the thing we cannot lose sight of, is mm -hmm. that how do we work together to not create a series of technical solutions, but to create a... Um, a vehicle that delivers improved outcomes for population and that's the kind of the piece of the jigsaw that we always have to hold on to okay right thanks. well thank you and we look forward to seeing you in, again um thanks. and we'll carry on with the work right thank you thank you right perhaps going on to perhaps a calmer subject now we'll go on to the joint strategic needs assessment 
and that is Simon. Chair, with with sorry uh, to interrupt, we're, we're due to go to the ageing well uh, deep dive theme focus. Are we? Oh, yeah. beg your pardon, Graham. Sorry, ageing well first, then then the joint strategic needs. Sorry, yes. What what I would suggest is, with with the greatest respect, some of us may feel as though we're we're ageing less well because we've been sat here for an hour and forty minutes. <laughs> And I wonder if perhaps it would be the right time before we get into this next item just to take a short comfort break. OK, shall we shall we say 10 minutes? And um, well, let's say, say eight minutes and meet back at 10 to 10. Perfect. Two Thank hours. you. OK. Thank you.
I'm aware of time. You've had the slides uh, in advance uh, with the papers that have been circulated. I will project them if it's OK. I'm not planning to um, spend too much time on some of the slides. I am hoping some of the comments uh, made earlier, though, through the course of the meeting around the added value that hopefully the board is able to bring uh, will be called out through the course, certainly of some of the um, latter slides. And indeed, there are a number of colleagues in the meeting today that are deeply involved in a number of things uh, that we will just be touching on. I'm really delighted as well that uh, my colleague from uh, Public Health uh, Abby Twaits is, is with me. Abby is absolutely the subject subject matter expert uh, in terms of um, uh, the penultimate slide uh, around the Live Longer Better program. Um, but without further ado, if I can uh, make a start. So firstly, just, just to re uh, remind us all, these are the high level uh, priorities within the current Health and Wellbeing Board uh, strategy. In terms of what we've been doing uh, through the course of, of COVID, again, I'm not going to uh, read through these, but just to say in terms of what we've needed to do quite rightly, quite properly to amend, review uh, and act uh, in terms of the strategic ambitions and to make sure they're fit for purpose with regard to our COVID response collectively across all parts of the system. Um, and I would absolutely uh, call out the brilliant, absolutely superb uh, participation and leadership of our uh, voluntary community sector uh, partners right the way across the whole of the Hampshire uh, geography working closely with the county, uh, with district and borough council partners, the NHS, other blue light services. It's been absolutely astounding. In terms of uh, some of the key elements, so this I think is a really interesting uh, update from uh, HUK. So this is a survey uh, that was run uh, last year and it's a survey that uh, I understand that they will continue as an organisation, a national organisation to run. In terms of um, that key theme around well-being, well-being of older people um, and key issues that are coming to the fore as a result and a consequence of uh, living through a pandemic. What will be interesting, and we will uh, keep a close eye on this as we go forward, is not only that Age UK national survey, but also more localised surveys in terms of the continuing impacts. And indeed, it was called out earlier in terms of uh, the deficit, perhaps it's being built up in the communities as a result of COVID in any number of different ways. But issue for us all collectively getting out and about that practical help and support that is so vital in order to maintain uh, independence, uh, actually throughout all ages, but particularly uh, for people in older age. In terms of um, uh, the uh, activities of Hampshire Fire and Rescue, the safe and well visits, uh, when we published the annual report a couple of months ago now, uh, some of the numbers had, had decreased. There's been some revision of those. Uh, some of it was a data Take any any questions or comments on this particular slide but it's really showing uh, the volume of activity that those um, safe and well visits have, have been able to maintain throughout despite a pandemic and that's also caused Hampshire Fire and Rescue to adopt uh, some new ways of working so some of that is around uh, telephone contact telephone triage and then being able to prioritize face-to-face -face visits so um, I think there's something um, underneath that, which is a, a key thing for us going forward in terms of we talk about the, the impact and the consequence of COVID quite rightly, but there have also been the adoption of some new ways of working. And I would absolutely say that as a board, uh, we need to stand behind continuing with the aspects of the, you know, those new ways of working that provide greater access, greater speed of response, greater efficiency for our organisations individually and collectively. And I think in terms of some of that work that Hampshire Fire and Rescue have done over the period, uh, it's a really good example. I would say with a, with another hat on, so as chair of the Hampshire uh, Safeguarding Adults Board, actually fire deaths are something that we are particularly focused on. There's been again great work uh, undertaken by one of our subgroups around fire safety. There's a new fire safety framework that has just been published, led by Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service. But actually the consequence of fire death uh, is very significant. Um, and again, we need to be attending to that. 
something that uh, we've spoken about at this board before, make every contact count. So where we are out and about visiting people, actually noticing their living environment. Uh, does it look safe for a whole variety of reasons, not just from, from a fire perspective, but just in terms of is the living environment something that is going to nurture and support people or is it something that may actually create danger is something I would please ask all of our staff across all of our organisations uh, to be cognizant of. Vaccination, it's really important just to reflect in terms of vaccination, um, particularly but not exclusively for older people. You'll see these are the um, vaccination rates across our geography. They're really, really positive. Again, I would want us just to, to underline the continuing encouragement of the whole of our population to come forward for vaccination it is really, really important. You see some uh, comparative figures there towards the bottom uh, of the slide. Uh, so some numbers there. I think some of them are uh, slightly out of date, so up to the end of December. Um, what we now know is if you look at social care staff, uh, across uh, the Hampshire geography, uh, approximately uh, 90%, I think the actual number is 89 point something percent of social care staff working in care home environments have had a first jab and around about 79% have had a second jab. I understand that colleagues working uh, in NHS settings, it's around about 91, 92% in terms of first and second jabs. So really, really good take up locally. Uh, but of course, the message in terms of encouragement uh, is as relevant across the health and social care sector as it is anywhere else. In terms of, um, and this, sorry, this is in, an indulgement, indulgence on, on my part. One of the things that I'm currently very, very focused on and have been for many months now um, is the, um, the health of the, the social care sector and in particular, the care home sector. So this slide is, is really just to show you uh, in terms of some of the COVID impacts that we saw through the spring of 2020 and through the winter of this year in terms of mortality in, in care home settings, which has led to a significant reduction in occupancy and reduction in occupancy in care homes leads potentially to increased financial uh, risk and a question mark over sustainability of that sector. What we're also seeing is uh, more support for people to live at home. So unsurprisingly, to some degree, and I think there's also some nervousness and anxiety as well because of med media coverage of deaths in care homes. Um, I would absolutely uh, want to, to draw a distinction, a difference that deaths in care homes do not re equate in any way to the quality of the care being provided. It's a consequence of a pandemic. Um, but what we are seeing are a lo lower number of admissions year on year. And again, that again underlines the fragility of the sector. It's really important that we continue to support a variety of supported living environments for uh, all people requiring them. It's a particular though area of concern with regard to older people and the nursing and residential uh, care home sector. We, along with partners, the NHS and also the Hampshire Care Association, uh, meet on a very regular basis. It's, it's virtually daily on some of the issues relating to keeping people safe. And we're also very attendant to the risk financially across the sector. It's not a Hampshire issue. Uh, it's a national issue. Just uh, moving forward, I just want to pick up some uh, some uh, key comments really in terms of digital enablement. So it does go, uh, I think, with that comment that I made earlier in terms of some of the ways in which organisations have changed their traditional operating models. They've had to pivot very, very quickly. And what we've seen is some absolutely phenomenal transformation in the ways that we're able to reach out uh, to residents, by and large all residents, but specifically residents with particular support needs. And there's been some phenomenal work done collectively across uh, our landscape over the last year in terms of supporting people who are vulnerable, people that are clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, again, I'm, I'm Please excuse me, but I must just make the board aware that the work that we uh, collectively undertook in terms of the community, extremely vulnerable community, some 83,000 people uh, needing to be contacted through three uh, waves of, of lockdown measures, uh, almost 200,000 people contacted. We used an AI driven system known as WAX, Welfare Automated Call System. That system and its deployment is just one 
the Global Public Sector Deployment Award by Amazon Web Services. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's a good thing to be recognised in that way, but that good thing enabled us to make sure that our most precious resource, i.e. our people, people working in voluntary community sector organisations, district borough council, the county council, NHS partners could be deployed to support people in the most efficient and effective way. There's also some other examples there in terms of, again, great stuff in terms of keeping people connected, uh, making sure that people are safe and well. I want to cut, call out um, a, a couple of things specifically, but before I, I do that, I do want to say that um, within the County Council, we, we have a, a track record in terms of the use of, of technology and digital programmes in terms of how we support people with uh, social care support uh, needs. The benefits of, of that approach, I think, can absolutely be extended more widely or, or around our collective work in supporting our population. I've already mentioned the WAC system. The key thing on this slide for me is um, actually 13,000 people today across Hampshire are being supported with technology enabled care by Hampshire County Council. Of that 13,000 people, more than half of them, the only support that they require, need or want is that technology enabled care. And that may be a, a voice controlled assistant. It may be uh, something that's providing them with a prompt. It's a device that they're able to carry so that if they're out and about, if they encounter any particular challenges or difficulties, they can immediately summon some support. There's a whole range of, of great stuff that is being done. And we've also uh, clearly deployed that around hospital discharge to make sure that acute hospitals uh, had sufficient capacity, particularly through the spring of last year, but also through uh, the winter and, and indeed still now in terms of uh, being able to, to uh, get people hopefully to a safe destination quickly and appropriately. The final thing, Cobot on this uh, slide, this is an exoskeleton. We are uh, in the process of the local authority. Uh, we believe outside of Japan, Japan, we're the only place anywhere else in the world that is deploying this for carers to be able to wear an exoskeleton, which gives them increased uh, ability for moving and handling less risk of uh, musculoskeletal injury. We're deploying it at scale. That will be happening from October of this year. We've concluded um, the, the procurement. We're waiting for devices to land in this country. We've got a small number already that we use through a trial. The outcomes in terms of improved uh, benefit for people both receiving care and also delivering care are absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think there's an opportunity as we go forward to make that kind of technology available in other settings. And the obvious one is, is healthcare settings. So really keen to, to talk to colleagues further about that in due course. Enough of the advertisement from me though. So, this is one of two call outs. Abby will pick up after this slide. I think that the shift to digital has been proven through um, our response to COVID. And, and I think against probably what many of us thought, uh, older people have absolutely adopted it in droves. To some degree, professionals, I think, were uh, nervous that this uh, shift to digital, making use of technology to stay in contact and a whole range of other things would not be something uh, that people um, by and large would be keen to do and old people in particular would be nervous of. Our experience over the last 15, 16 months now is the absolute opposite. And indeed the testimonies that we've received from people throughout new ways of doing things uh, really underline that point. I think there is a huge amount of opportunity uh, for us going forward collectively. I think there's a huge amount of experience, not only within the County Council and within social care, but the wider community in terms of the use of all kinds of technology. And we need to be sharing uh, and thinking of, of acting differently and in new ways that can keep pace with how best we can support our population. The key point is, of course, we must not leave anyone behind. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that shifting to digital and making use of technology is the panacea. But what it does do is it enables us to do uh, a number of the things that we must do more efficiently and I would I would suggest more appropriately at a time of our population's choosing rather than a time of our choosing within our respective organisations. You'll see on that on this slide 
Uh, key contact from my perspective is my colleague Mark Allen. We're not related, uh, but Mark is is more than happy to respond to to any queries, comments, or indeed requests that may come in his direction. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Abby uh, to take us through uh, the slide after this. I apologies, Abby, uh, building you up. But again, there's there's a huge amount of work being done with regard to falls prevention, and there are huge opportunities there as we go forward. Abby, over to you. Thank you, Graham. So um, Live Longer Better is an initiative set up originally by Samuel Gray and the Oxfordshire Act Active Partnership. It's championed locally by um, Adults Health and Care and our colleagues in Energise Me. Essentially, the programme is to increase healthy life expectancy. So we live a long time, but we live approximately 15 years in poor health, which of course um, contributes to um, the impact on the health and care system. So the approach of Live Longer Better is to use physical activity as a lever to prevent ill health and also to rebuild our independence. So our physical activity tends to decline uh, year on year from about our 20s. So it's no surprise that we perceive our loss of mobility and therefore our increased need uh, for support due to our age when it's really about that we've lived more years of our lives without being physically active. So another key factor of Live Longer Better is a change in culture and attitudes towards older people. So we generally use the term vulnerable to describe anybody that needs care and support. And we want to shift that to a much more positive approach using positive imagery and language. We have individuals who are incredibly caring by nature and really want to protect others. So a quick quote from our um, We Can Be Active online conversation from Energize Me was, I have a health condition and people instantly don't want me to hurt myself or to make it worse. So sometimes that protective nature can actually disable people even more so. And we really want to shift at looking at what people's potential is for what they can do. So looking at evidence from public health and demand management and prevention in the Hampshire County Council, we want to really focus on some of these high impact areas. And we've also since discussed adding in dementia as a, um, a golden thread throughout all of these. We really want to um, harness that fantastic contribution that tech and digital can make, as Graham and others have previously mentioned. Um, and we want to look at workforce development. So recognising our vast contribution that the voluntary sector and unpaid care this makes to the health and care sector. We want to really support them to um, harness this approach as well. And lastly, it's just a brilliant opportunity to bring together all of the ICS system, including friendly, and um, work on uh, physical activity, uh, including the new Energise Me strategy. So I'll quickly just hand back to Graham, who's going to finish off the presentation, just with some of the recommendations to the board. Abby, thank you very much indeed. So, so colleagues, the recommendations are as noted on the screen. The first one, clearly, please, uh, grateful if you can note the progress both within um, the slide deck this morning, but also through the comments we made through the annual report uh, a few months ago. And I do really want to, if if possible, please, uh, Councillor Fairhurst, just just really kind of open up for a bit of a conversation around those uh, those last two. So the technology approach, I'm really keen, particularly with NHS colleagues, but not only with NHS colleagues. Uh, in terms of, of how we can collectively uh, link programmes together and also based on, on what Abby has just covered, uh, the Live Longer Better programme I think is absolutely superb and I want us all to get fully behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Any questions? I've, uh, there's one, there's at least one hand up, but I don't know whose it is. Uh, Simon, your hands up. I think it's Patricia Hughes before me, if that's okay. Order. And okay, uh, Philip, uh, uh, Patricia, you go first. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So I, I completely wholeheartedly agree with Graham's uh, uh, conversation around some of the successes this year and uh, the use of wax, because the districts were party to those conversations as part of, the, of our 
local um, response centres. So, and, and, and you know, Graham offered it up to us as well and said, actually, this WAC system has got great opportunities to be shared across boundaries. So I think I'd like to register my thanks to that because I think there's technologies there which could be shared and used in other different and innovative ways across the Hampshire Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, I suppose my question is not pertain to these directly so I'm going to be a little bit cheeky but I think this is an appropriate point my apologies Graham but there's been a general conversation about waiting well which is I think pertains to people who are often in that older age bracket which is we know that they, we've got substantive delays due to the COVID pandemic in terms of um, treatment. Uh, they call it elective. I don't know how having your hip replaced is ever something you choose to do. I find it a slightly strange um, nomenclature for that one. But actually, I wonder whether there's an opportunity around some of this digital work and around some of this uh, in terms of supporting our residents to wait well so they don't worsen their condition in the year they may be waiting for those operations. I just wondered whether we could bring that waiting well conversation across the two Hampshire and Frimley systems into this debate a little bit. Yeah, th th thanks, Patricia. And, and you know, cl clearly other colleagues will be better positioned than, than I am to, to respond to some of the specifics around that. But what I would say is, I, I think, um, and, and this again is, you know, it's learning, it's, it's, it's not brand spanking new, it's stuff that I think probably intuitively most of us already knew that if if people are uh, needing to form an orderly queue and wait for something actually it's reassuring if from time to time there's a conversation that says we know that you're waiting um, is there anything that that we can help you with aside from the thing that you're really waiting for in the meantime i think systems like wax but not only wax you know there there are other technical solutions that can help uh, our population, both in terms of us understanding what, what's going on for them, but also what collectively we might be able to do in the meantime. And I, I think, you know, it was said earlier um, by Simon, in terms of you might be waiting for your hip replacement, but actually um, if you can, you know, be mobilising, taking some exercise in the meantime, and that's not going to be possible clearly for, for, for all, but actually the benefit of then having that hip operation in due course may be even greater to you whilst you're waiting. So keeping you know as active as possible, uh, maintaining uh, good weight control and so on and so forth. So there's, there's probably a whole range of things that could be made available. And I think that, you know, whether it's AI driven or technology driven, it's digital, whatever, uh, offers something into that mix of ingredients for our population. Right. Simon. Yeah, I'll just build on that first of all and say we are doing that work with the NHS, particularly to stand, understand who's waiting and actually how do we how do we make sure we don't exacerbate inequalities by waiting. So there's a lot awful lot of work going on in that space. And I think uh, absolutely support what Graham said and uh, endorse uh, these recommendations. I think one of the challenges Graham has in this space that actually healthy ageing requires a lifelong approach and actually just trying to fix things at the end is not going to work. So I think we do need to think about how we um, work through this with our kind of work around physical activity and many other things so that actually we're preparing for healthy ageing much earlier, which I think is a real challenge for our population who perhaps don't want to think about old age in that way and how we do that. But I absolutely endorse what, what's going on here. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Philip. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you for that, Graham. The whole digital thing is really exciting, but my, my question is slightly more mundane. When you talked earlier about the, the drop in the um, admission rates from 605 to 490, I think you contextualise that as that's a, a challenge, a problem. Um, so there's two parts, if that's right, you know, up, because a lot of what you're trying to do is to make people fit and well and cope at home. So not having to go into care is good. But this, the implication that I almost got was that there's a bunch of people out there who aren't really coping at home because they actually need to get into a home. Uh, can you, if that is what you are saying, can you quantify that a little bit? And what are we trying to do about that? Thanks. Yeah, th th thank you. And there, there's, of course, uh, nuance behind uh, the, 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 the question, indeed, the, the response I'm about to give. So, sorry, the point I was, I was really trying to make is that we historically seen a rate of around about 600 uh, per 100,000 our population going into care home settings. That rate now has dropped quite significantly. 
that brings about a set of circumstances that make the sustainability of the care home sector problematic going forward. So just to unpick that a little bit more, uh, typically, um, and of course, the, the economics of a care home business will depend on the specifics of the individual care home. Some are larger, some carry debt because of you know mortgaging and so on and so forth, others don't. But most care homes really are economically viable where they run at around about 80, uh, sorry, 90% occupancy. And we've got occupancy rates across the whole sector at the moment of somewhere between 75 and 85%. And the reason I'm giving that variation is if you look at the number of CQC registered beds, the occupancy is 75%. If you look at the number of beds that care home providers themselves are declaring as being available because they've got staffing challenges in the same way that many other uh, sectors and organisations have, then the, the occupancy rate is 85%. But one way or another, it's below what we would estimate to be the, the usual market sustainability of the care home sector. You're quite right though, and it's it's the um, it's the strategy of, of adults health and care within the county council that we are creating different opportunities for people to live more independently. So extra care housing, for example, whether that's younger adults, older adults, more opportunities around different forms of supported living, shared lives, there's a whole variety. There's, there's a menu of alternatives to a care home setting. But in order to get to uh, more extra care housing, more shared lives, and so on and so forth, we need enough time to build them in order to support people appropriately. And what we're seeing is a little bit of a potential cliff edge in terms of particularly people with nursing care needs who may need to be uh, going into a nursing care home, but there may not be sufficient nursing care capacity in due course if we see closures to then be able to accommodate people. So that, that's the point for me, is we're on a little bit of a knife edge at the moment, sustainability of the sector and our ability to meet the needs of our population in the short term as we're, you know, seeking to build more and more extra care units at pace. We're about to open a new development in Romsey uh, in the next couple of months. Again, you know, absolutely flagship development uh, with, with local partners in terms of extra care living. More younger adults extra care will come forward, but we can, you know, practically build them at the pace in order to pick up what we may see in terms of the care home market in due course. But we are working very closely with the representative body uh, for the care associations across Hampshire. No, that's very helpful, Graham. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Julie. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I think um, what I wanted to say in the context of, of this report is that this is a brilliant example of how a system can come together to bring about change in population health if we all play our part. So Abby was talking about, about um, one of our online participants in the We Can Be Active conversation and it is about sort of starting from that strength based approach about what people can do rather than what they can't do and, and when we're trying to be kind to our loved ones when we're saying oh I'll get that for you or whatever well think actually is it better for you to do that or is it better for you to support your loved one to, um, to continue to be active and, and do things for themselves um, what I would say is that there's the, there's the sectors out there are ready to help in, in terms of people that are waiting for operations. Um, we know that people have better outcomes from operations if um, they're healthy as they can be when they go into hospital. And I was only talking to one of the leisure sector providers this week who have trained staff and can train staff in order to work with people that have different con health conditions, long-term conditions and, and, and other health conditions. The data sharing comes back into this because can we be proactive with um, people that are waiting on, on, on patient lists, et cetera? So, but have we got the right permissions in place to be able to do that? Uh, we know that clinical staff will have a much um, bigger effect on people's decisions to change behaviour if they have that conversation. So if, if clinical staff are encouraging um, patients to be active, they're more likely to do that. And the final thing that I would say is, again, this is another positive thing. And I think, Graham, it is for looking you know, to the positive. I'm a, I'm a really optimistic person in, in general, but 
if you look to the great things that have come out of um, the pandemic, if, if, if you can put it in, in, in that way, the digital enablement has been um, really, really important and can continue into the future. So we've invested in some um, projects ourselves to help people to engage in a digital offer while things like leisure centres and other places have been closed. People that might have uh, long-term conditions, people that might have um, learning difficulties, physical um, disabilities, etc. And I think the sector will continue, and certainly talking to a leisure provider earlier this week, they, the leisure centres and places um, where people can be active are going to look at these blended offers and that will continue into the future. So uh, there's lots of reasons to be optimistic, but um, I think the bringing together of, of the different players in the system to play their part can really help each other for the benefit of, of our people in our communities. Julie, I would 100% endorse all of that. And, and what I would say so that this next comment of course includes me and, and my services in this i think the public service organizations um, across hampshire have got a huge amount to learn for the voluntary community sector so we've seen the voluntary community sector coming together uh, in ways in terms of pooling resource pooling ideas and delivering outcomes of course that has happened across the public sector organization but i think it's still part of the DNA of all of the public server or service organizations to create their own projects, uh, rather than say what's already out there and how can we add value to something that already exists rather than create it in our own name. So I, I think we've got something to learn from uh, the VCS uh, and others. Um, and I would encourage you and indeed other VCS partners to keep um, pointing that out to us. Thank you. Paula. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, uh, sorry, I agree with that last point as well um, from Graham and from Julie. Really, please do the same with us. I know we're included in what you've just said, Graham, but um, I think it's an opportunity we've not taken full advantage of and we really should do. Um, I, the, the thing I was just going to come in was I really welcome this presentation. It was great to see. Um, I suppose my quick challenge or question is, um, we talked earlier about wicked issues and how um, sometimes that is the you know how we have blockages that and I just wondered whether there is anything around this that you would be described in that way you know however gently um, and the second thing on digital uh, I, I really want to support how we do this better within um, certainly within uh, my sector because I think there's masses of opportunity and I really appreciate how far actually the um, Hampshire have gone on this you know in advance um, and uh, really helpfully so I will pick that up internally I'm going to go on mute now because somebody's cutting their grass apologies <laughs> yeah th thanks Paula um, and we'd be absolutely delighted to, to you know have follow-up conversations with with Southern indeed everyone else on the call in in terms of uh, technology and and how we can we can pull the knowledge and experience that collectively we, we we've got it really wasn't a case of me saying we know best. It's a case of saying let, let's align behind a particular approach collectively. Um, I, I think in terms of, of some of the, the other things I, I would call out, I'm not, not intending to, to get too specific or, or embarrass anyone, but there is a conversation I've had uh, recently with, with, a, with a colleague in terms of a really good piece of work that's been under, undertaken within one of our local communities, but to some degree it's replicating 100% work that's already underway both through um, the Live Longer Better program and indeed other things and and um, I'll, I'll just kind of frame it in this way that, that in the last couple of years the NHS you know much to its credit God bless it has discovered something called social prescribing well actually in in um, other parts of the wider public sector and indeed the vo wider voluntary community sector uh, we've been doing that thing described as social prescribing for the last, last 30 years that I've worked in the sector and probably for the last 70 years uh, that the local government has, has had a, a, a sort of social care responsibility. Please, please, please don't replicate stuff that already exists. Find more time to determine what is out there and how you can add to it. That would be my, my final pint shot. 
Thank you. Simon. I guess if I can just jump on the back of uh, Graham's comment, there's something about what is our system approach to falls prevention? Actually, we're very good at picking these people up, doing a, uh, some kind of uh, hip revision or something, and then actually, uh, you know, sadly, we know many after a, hip, a fall will then uh, die. Many end up in adult services. Actually, let's take a systems approach to falls prevention and really uh, and treatment and get it all right. Um, and I would that be my plea. Yeah, absolutely, Simon. Right, Graham, Abby, thank you both very much. You, you seem to have got off quite lightly with the questions, so thank thank you both. And we'll move thank you. on. Thank Thanks, Abby. Thanks very much for joining us. Yeah. Great work. We'll move on to Simon and the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. Yeah, thank you very much, Hans uh, Um, You've got a paper in your pack. If I can just if you're looking at that, if I can highlight page 52, which is kind of the summary of where we are, uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board has um, responsibility for ensuring it has a JSMA and then that responsibility is discharged to me. However, I, I guess at the outset, I want to say organisations, I ask that you take a really active part in developing the Joint Street Needs Assessment. Make sure your analysts and the people who are um, into information in your organisations are connected in, because actually we can make this really, really good. And sometimes it's seen with public health doing that. Well, if we do it together, we're going to get a better product. So that's my ask. Um, we are going to refresh our joint student assessment um, and do that in a number of ways. So first of all, we're going to make sure we have some core documents about demographics, um, deprivation of those uh, aspects. Uh, also think about what we've called inclusion health groups. So those more vulnerable groups to poor health and they're listed there. We're also then going to do what we're calling a health impact assessment, um, really around the impact of COVID on health, which I think is really important we talked about before. So really get into the nitty gritty of actually how has COVID impacted on the health and well-being of our population. And then finally, coming through to the winter, we're going to really look at three main chapters of our, our joint street needs assessment around healthy people, around healthy living and around healthy places. Now, I know they're all interconnected and you have to cut the cake um, in some way. Uh, so we've cut it in this way, thinking about um, the, the kind of people and uh, almost our genetics and those kind of things. What about the lifestyle factors and the behavioural risk factors, our working conditions and the healthy living? And then healthy places, because we know place and people are so uh, intertwined in terms of health. So things about green space, the environment, access to housing. So that's our proposal of, uh, that we are putting forward to the Health and Wellbeing Board. We welcome comments um, uh, on that development and we will of course bring back the uh, products uh, in time when they're developed and would be put on our website going forward. Right, thank you. Uh, Patricia. Sorry, Simon, just a quick one, but it also reflects the earlier conversation about the ICS and a new focus on economic activity. Um, I might have missed it in my reading of it, but does it also reference employment status? Because, of course, that can quite often be a very large factor in terms of an indicator of health outcomes. And I can't see that on that list. Uh, I think it's probably it's got unemployment and related to employment and it's got working conditions. So it's got both those things in the healthy living chapter, probably not. Uh, quite in the way you said it, but they're definitely in there. Thank you. My apologies. I think I was looking under healthy places, so it's more yeah. like looking in the wrong place. But thank you, Simon. Uh, and as as we said, you know, you could change, you could cut it in different ways, but that's where it sits. And, and this is based on the World Health Organization, so we thought uh, let's copy that. Right. Any other questions for Simon? I can see another hand. I'm not sure if that. Oh, so, so can I? But I can't see oh. who it belongs to. I don't know if it's, it's Jenny. Hand. It's uh, Jenny. Oh, um, Jenny's works for my team as we develop the JSNA. Jenny, did you want to comment? Yeah, just to expand on what you said, Simon. So the health impact assessment, we are we are very near the end of that. And that looks at, just following on from that question, that looks at just the health impacts, but also the impact of policy, because actually it's the impact of the non-pharmaceutical intervention policies, such as the economic policies that, um, that you've mentioned, which have had huge ramifications for population groups that we've never seen before. So what the impact of health impact assessment will do is inform the priorities for these three chapters. And these three chapters, um, as Simon says, they've been driven by the Office for National Statistics Health Index, 
But we, what we want to do working with partners is just scope them fully. So these are suggestions that we're saying will be in those chapters, but we want to align it to the strategy, the health and wellbeing strategy, the public health strategies, but also work with partners to ensure that these chapters, albeit strategic as they have to be, but they do encompass what's required for everybody. And apologies, I should have introduced Jenny at the beginning. Thank you, Simon. Barbara. Just really to endorse what you're doing, Simon, I think it's really, really important to do this work around the impact of COVID um, and, and absolutely agree with the rest of the, of the stuff. This is so important. It's absolutely vital now to how the ICS moves forward in a partnership. Brilliant. Thank you, Barbara. Right. Any, any more comments? No, can I just ask the board then to, to note the JSNA programme and to develop it with engagement with other organisations in the future. Yes. Thank you very much, Simon. And, and colleagues, uh, if you get an email from me as a board member saying, can we have access to the relevant analysts, please can you uh, take that up and forward the relevant names to us? That'd be really helpful. Thank you. Right, Simon, I think it's you again with the update to the pharmaceutical needs assessment. It is. Thank you, Councillor Professor. A short paper here. Um, for those who've been around the board for a number of times, you'll um, recall that the uh, pharmaceutical needs assessment is the responsibility of the board. Um, so I just wanted to update the board where we've got. Also update the board on some of the consolidation applications, and I'll talk a little bit about them because they're they're not as straightforward as it, as it looks. Um, but we have to do a pharmaceutical needs assessment every three years, and again led by Jenny Bowers uh, in my team. And um, But due to COVID, that has been delayed, so I wanted the board to formally note that we are delaying that. That doesn't mean the information on the pharmaceutical needs assessment currently is out of date because we update it, but the formal refresh uh, will now be delayed until April 2022, so that's a bit delayed. Um, on the consolidation applications, uh, when a pharmacy, neighbouring pharmacies want to merge together, they uh, have to apply for consolidation applications. Uh, and as a health and wellbeing board, we respond to those. Those are the only things we're asked to respond to. So if a pharmacy closes, we're not asked, that we're not uh, consulted on that. So it's a slightly bizarre set of circumstances when we're only asked to respond to the consolidations. And we take that piece of work and we look at it and see how far the nearest pharmacy is, what the population is and what the impact would be. With a consolidation, the services in each of the pharmacies have to be provided in the new setup. So if pharmacy A provides services A, B and C and pharmacy B doesn't, when they consolidate, they have to provide those new services. So there have been three consolidation applications uh, since I last brought an update. Uh, one in Andover, uh, one in uh, Lymington and one in Havant. Uh, and the outcome is some of them are still waiting. We were also asked to determine whether uh, there was a local uh, controlled locality determination. And that was about whether an area is urban or rural. And that's really important because if it's rural, there's special situations. If it's become urban because of development, um, it sits in a different category. So we look at the information on that. So we have present, presented information. All we do is present the facts uh, and then NHS England make that decision. So that's where we are. And those are the situations that we have given our, our views on. And if they're um, at all, uh, I can consult with the chair if there's anything we need to pick up. Uh, Councillor Fairhurst, so I'll stop there on that very uh, procedural piece of work. Thank you, Simon. Is, is any, any comments, any questions, or is the board happy to note this? Happy to note it and move on. That's good. Thank you, Simon. And we look at the forward agenda now and actually following on from this morning, we've got two, two other things that perhaps we want to put into October. One is Richard coming back to talk to us about the ICS and um, whether the board members would like the Alzheimer's Society to come and talk to us about their latest research into the pathway with, for people with dementia. Um, how do people feel about that? Uh, Patricia. My apologies, Chairman, I was going to suggest an alternative or, or an additional item, so I, I, it wasn't related to that particular item. OK. Well. Uh, Simon. 
uh, Kath Vez, I really like the idea of uh, some of these uh, agencies such as Dementia Society coming. What I'm mindful of is does that open the door that everyone starts to come forward and how we manage that really carefully. And it might be that uh, we have a meeting outside and bring a summary. I, I'm really uh, open to sessions, but I don't want to then get in a, a situation where we're constantly being asked to receive some new research from a, uh, a charity. OK, well, let's talk about that offline. Um, I, I just felt it, it dovetailed very neatly with, with doing our dying well and the pathway of dementia to dying well with dementia. I just thought the two went together quite well. So perhaps um, in that context, that would work and we could do that as that rationale. That might work very well. Yeah. OK. Julie. Well, I was just going to say, I think if it could help us understand some of the challenges and the blockers and the you know, problems within the system that the, the board can have an impact upon, if the, mm -hmm. if the presentation has that kind of focus, um, yeah. what it needs from the system, how it needs the system to adapt, that would be a, a productive, because what might apply here might apply for other conditions as well. So if it, if it can come forward with that kind of thinking, it may, may be helpful to, to the board. Thank you. Okay. Any other suggestions for what we should be looking at in October? Julie, I think you had also requested a physical activity strategy update, didn't you, for October? Yeah, I had, because the, the strategy will be ready and we'll be able to tell you about some of the responses, um, you know, how we're going to activate the, the strategy and, and so on. So, it, yeah, that is, a, that is a, an option. Well, not, not an option. I would very much like to um, have that opportunity. Thanks. <laughs> OK, is there anything else that you want to see on there, Samaya, as our programme manager? I just had a quick review. So I think we do have the Dying Well deep dive and then we yeah. have the updated business plan that Simon and I will work on and come back to you with as well. OK, Christine. Hi. Um, you may remember that at the last meeting I said that Simon and I were due to have a conversation about how to um, how to get the co-production bit uh, reflected in his responsibilities of strategic leadership. And we did have a chat, a useful meeting uh, back in, I can't remember exactly when, um, <laughs> April, May. Um, and at that, we thought that we what didn't didn't feel appropriate to bring a report back to this meeting, but we did say that we might look to bring back a report to the coming meeting, the December, the October one, or potentially the December one, about where we'd got to. Um, Simon, do you have a view about whether October or December would be better? Uh, I just wanted probably link to Smire in the. Um Fullness of the board, I just wonder if we want to kind of give proper time to that because obviously we've got a very full morning. Uh, so it might, I mean, I'm, I'm not particularly uh, concerned either way. So, Samaya, should we go outside and work out the timing that's best? I think we'll need to just look at all of it together and then come back to everyone if that's okay. And if it doesn't come to October, it will definitely come to December. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. That might be better because it will enable my replacement and to have sort of settled Hello. down a bit. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Patricia. If I may, there was one item which uh, was mentioned at the last meeting. We had hoped it would be on this meeting, and therefore I would like to get it onto the next meeting, which was actually around the role that planning has to play in health and wellbeing. It follows on from the conversation we had uh, our colleagues from Transport who came to speak to us at the last board meeting, and there was a recognition uh, that planning forms a major part in terms of how spaces and places are designed for health and well-being and actually I thought there would be a really good conversation around that so I wanted to make sure that that was also registered on the full program for October or December. Samaya have you taken you've got that down? I have that down thank you. Thank you. Oh Alex is coming back just as Right. OK, welcome back, Alex. Um, we're, it's OK. We're just talking about our future work programme, and I just wondered if there's anything you, you would like to ask uh, or see on the agenda. Uh, 
Well, that's on mute. Um, I think the way it's built around the um, the various programmes is is really positive. There wasn't anything when I looked through it. It looked fairly comprehensive to me. To me, um, I think did we have trans? We talked at one point about transport, didn't we? And whether there was something on that that we wanted to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Is that in there or not? I didn't know if I saw that. So they were at the previous meeting, our last meeting. Yeah. Yeah, so whether it was an item we wanted to bring back at another point was around whether the, the transport um, strategies were important. Yeah, and um, right. Can we take that on board and talk about it offline and look at it? Yeah, yes, for future. Of course. Right. Anyone else? Christine, is that a legacy hand or do you want something else? My apologies, it was a legacy. Okay. Right. I think I think that means that we have actually finished for today. So can I thank you all for your time and energy? And I look forward to seeing you in, in October, if not before. Okay, thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank you.